Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Welcome <coughs> to this afternoon's uh, program after Wakanda, bridging the Middle Passage. My name is Anthony Knight, and I'm the founder and president of the Bataan Foundation. And uh, how many of you were here last year for uh, our first After Wakanda program? Only two people. Very good. Um, if you could please, before we get started, silence your cell phones uh, so that we're not um, distracted. So for many of you who have not been to a Bataan Foundation program before, we created the organization four years ago. We've been doing programs now for three years. And the reason for which we started the, the foundation was to help educate black boys about black history and culture. And of course, it's important also to involve uh, not only the families, but the community. And so we also started doing these public programs and a component of the public program activities in which we are involved are these community conversations, topics focused specifically on issues of relevance uh, to the black community, things where we can kind of gather as a family, as it were, and uh, engage each other in, in dialogue. This program started last year after the release of Black Panther. And we, a group of us came together and we thought that we would talk about Black Panther because some of us saw things um, in the community that was maybe a little disturbing regarding how black folks were bringing, welcoming the movie. Um, some of us really loved it, others of us not so much. And so we thought we'd bring uh, a program that could help the community engage in that conversation and talk about what the movie Black Panther meant uh, for the community. And so we had a panelist then, um, two of whom are joining us this year. Uh, at the end of last year's program, there was one individual in the audience who expressed an interest in being involved uh, if we did something in the future. And so we have Azena joining us today. And uh, today's focus really follows up on last year's conversation and the uh, information that Black Panther brings out it is relevant to our community. So the structure is going to be like this. We're going to um, have a moderator, Eric, who also uh, moderated our program last year. He's a filmmaker here in Atlanta from Ghana. And he is going to ask us, and I'm actually going to be on the panel, um, he's going to ask us a couple of questions to kind of get us started. We're going to each talk a little bit about our personal backgrounds, which is why I'm not introducing anyone now. So we'll talk a little bit about our personal backgrounds. Eric will ask us three or four questions that we'll each address to get us started. And then we're going to open it up immediately so that you can join in. Um, there are microphones on either side of the auditorium, so I encourage you, if you have a question or a comment, come to the front when we open up the floor and um, ask your question or make your comment. I also want to ask that you be brief. Um, we have two hours. Lots of us have emotions and thoughts and feelings about the subject matter. We understand that. We are certainly not going to cover everything today. Um, so please be mindful of others who are in line and who would like to ask a question or make a comment and keep your remarks very brief. And we have to, as a panel, remember, remember to do the same thing. Um, and so I'm going to stop talking and so we can get started. Thank you so much for coming. And we hope this is really uh, a meaningful conversation. And I'll just say one thing before I leave. This is gonna be the last after Wakanda. We know the Academy Awards are coming up and we know they're gonna do a sequel and okay, great. But during, during one of our conversations to plan this program, it was mentioned by s someone who was present. She's from the Caribbean, and she thought, well, you know, we need to have this conversation too. And so we decided there's not going to be any more after Wakanda stuff. 
and we're going to create a platform so that we can engage Africans in the diaspora, no matter where they're from, so that we can have conversations with each other uh, that hopefully over time will address a number of issues. So this is not the last conversation, it's the last after Wakanda, but we are going to create a platform where we can have an ongoing conversation with that includes all of us blacks in the diaspora. So enough of that. So let me bring out the panelists. Guys, if you can come out, take your seats. And Mr. Eric, if you could come out, our moderator, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. Good. Everybody's excited to be here? Yeah? Good. Um, I want to start first by addressing three words, history, culture, and identity. Um, those are very powerful words. History may connect us all together. Culture may separate us, separate us by geography. Identity is for each individual to determine their own identity. Um, I'm saying that because when we talk about the black culture around the world, um, we do have some of us identify as Africans, African Americans, and some simply as black. We also have the Afro-Latinidad, the Afro-Caribbean, and all those things that different subgroups from one history that separate us at some level. Now, for the matter of this particular conversation, um, what, uh, the movie Black Panther basically was a very powerful movie because it was able to bring us back to that history and give us a perspective on what could have been of our history if not divided, if not, you know, us, if history hasn't taken its toll with the transatlantic uh, slave trade. So um, in that, we have, to, we have to understand how powerful this movie was, uh, not only on the commercial level, but also the nuances that actually fed to us and that we are, that allows us to sit here tonight and be able to have this conversation about the tensions or the relationship between Africans and African Americans. Um, so before I get started, I would like to, by a show of hand, find out how, how do you identify? Do you identify as black, African Americans, or African? By a show of hand, how do you identify as African American? Who identifies as African American? Who identifies as African? Who identifies as Afro Latino? Afro Caribbean? Black. So, we identify as more than one. Thank you. It's a community conversation, so thank you for saying that. Awesome. Great. So, with that, we're going to start um, this conversation. That means we are connected somehow by history, but also are different. And the only way to actually bridge a gap is through conversation and allowing ourselves to be open to other cultures. That's how people get to bridge a gap understanding, listening, and speaking out from our own experiences. With that, I'm gonna open the floor, start with the, uh, our panelists here. And um, uh, if you guys can take a minute, introduce yourselves, and uh, basically um, tell us as well how you identify and where you come from and uh, what's your experience as your identity in this country. Good afternoon, my name is Azena, and I am, I am multicultural. <laughs> I'm Nigerian by parentage and heritage, but I'm also African American, black American, and I pretty much open myself to identifying with or understanding um, anyone who is black, <laughs> or pretty much all people, but certainly anyone who is black. Um, You can move on to us. Well. And I'm Anthony. I identify mostly as black, although professionally I will identify as African American. Uh, my father is, was uh, 
flat from Florida, Central Florida, Sanford, Florida. Uh, my grandparents on that side. Uh, my grandfather was from South Georgia. My grandmother from Sanford, Florida. My mom's family is a lot more complex. It's um, very European, um, although there is, of course, African blood, but the family eventually landed in Barbados. Um, so uh, her family is very complex. <laughs> but that's where I come from. Good afternoon. My name is Linnell Fenner. I identify myself as African American black. And um, is that the only part of it that we, you want us to answer? Yes, you can, you can leave it at that, and then we can move on with you know, the next question. Jean-Patrick. Hi, my name is uh, Jean-Patrick. Um, my father was from Guinea and my mother from New York, so I'm African American, but I identify more with uh, African. People ask me, I said I'm from Guinea, uh, because that's the, where I grew up, that's the culture I have. Good. Um, so, growing up, what were the images or the stereotypes, or were you aware of any tensions between African and African Americans? Were there stereotypes that kind of like um, basically informed your, your view of each group? Growing up, I, um, I spent the first, I was born here, and that was a distinction that later on in my life I ended up finding I had to make that for people often, and they would oftentimes only hear that I'm Nigerian. They wouldn't hear that I was born in America, grew up in America, but also spent time in Nigeria, and so I have um, identity and embrace both sides. So I wasn't really aware of tensions per se. Um, I was aware of differences, but I wasn't aware of tensions until I got to college and started having more conversations with friends, especially as college tends to stimulate you to think outside the box and talk about things that you normally did not cover when you were a teenager or younger. Because when I spent time in Nigeria and came back to the US, yes, the kids in elementary school at the time in sixth grade, they made fun of my accent because when I came back, I, I did have a traditionally, a stereotypical um, African English accent. Um, so they made fun of my accent and asked me where I was from, and that was a time when they wouldn't necessarily hear me when I would say, I'm from here. <laughs> but they say, you don't sound like you're from here. <laughs> okay, yes, I lived in Nigeria for 10 years. Oh, okay, so what does that mean? Um, and similarly, in, um, in junior high and high school, those, those differences um, were evident, but it wasn't until I started having more mature conversations with peers in college that I was aware of the sensitivities regarding um, regarding having a group that is identifying or from specifically from Africa and knowing where my parents and their parents came from or which village or household exactly versus um, a person who would say, well, I'm a descendant of slaves and I don't know where exactly in Africa or West Africa I come from. And that's when I became, so college was about when I became aware of those tensions. Uh, growing up, I wasn't really aware of tensions between black Americans and Africans. I was more aware of the tensions between black Americans and Caribbeans because my mom's family, uh, my grandmother in particular, mostly, is, mostly identifies as um, someone from Barbados. And my dad's family, with whom I grew up more and with whom I interacted more, um, were what I call regular black folk from the South. And uh, so, I, but I grew up in New York. <coughs> and so my grandmother, I remember distinctly my grandmother, my father's mother, often talking about those people, meaning my mother's family, the West Indians. <laughs> I remember my grandmother talking a lot about West Indians. And I also remember my mother's family, my grandmother in particular, um, talking about blacks, and she was not thrilled. My mother is very fair-skinned, and in fact, my grandmother tried to get her to pass for white at one point when she was growing up. Uh, but I remember my mother's mother talking about blacks and not, and having a feeling that she didn't particularly like black people. And in fact, when we were growing up in the late 60s, 
we had huge afros. And we went over to my grandmother's home one day and she admonished my mom, asking her, why do you have these kids wearing these afros? They look like little African bush babies. And I think that was the first time I felt something was wrong with Africa. Um, because my grandmother just called me an African bush baby. And much to my mother's credit, she immediately got us kids together and we were out the door. Um, but I don't remember any other tensions, really. I don't think I really knew any African people, at least not that I was conscious of, until college. And uh, there were no tensions because they integrated fully within the very small black community that was on Ohio Wesleyan's campus. And so where there might have been tension in another um, scenario, because the population of blacks was so small, about 70 out of 2,000, uh, there was really no room for us to be quarreling or bickering amongst each other. We, um, everyone was part of the team. But what I did notice in college was that whites treated the African students differently. That I noticed in college and would later notice at other times in my life. Um, they seemed more, uh, it, they seem to more easily interact with them, the foreign students, than they could inter interact with the regular old black folk here. Thank you. <coughs> at least that was my kind of subconscious feeling at that time. Thank you. Lynette? Yes. Um, being um, from Brooklyn, from Brooklyn in the 60s, and of course, uh, ancestors from the South migrated to New York for better work opportunities. But being from Brooklyn and having a host of communities around me, the Caribbean, uh, the Spanish, uh, the Africans, as a matter of fact, during that time, we had a sense of pride when we thought of Africa because that told us that we weren't just slaves, but we also, we came from kings and queens and that everything about our black skin that was, um, at first taught to be despised, they said the black are the better, black is beautiful. So my interpretation of, and the image that I found from Africa and Africans at, during my growing up, my teens and young, young time is that Africa represented power for me. And uh, Caribbeans brought flavor. And the Puerto Rican and the Hispanic showed us that we, even from those islands, they were dark like me. So I only grew up with positive images about differences. We knew we were different, but if, if we were in a room all together with the same <coughs> complexion, nobody could tell who was from Africa and who was from the Caribbean and who was from Brooklyn. So I grew up with a sense of pride about it all. Um. I grew up in Guinea. Uh, Guinea was one of the first countries that claimed uh, independence uh, from the colon from French, from the from France, and be it as such, uh, basically, Guinea kicked out the French out of the country. So, my interaction with any other was very limited, because we we're all. African from Guinea and so forth, different shades and stuff. And <coughs> being that it was also that it became a uh, dictatorship, we kind of set aside the differences that we had or that we could have had to kind of like think about the common enemy that we had, which was the head of the country, which was uh, a dictator, not understanding what he was uh, trying to do. Like most uh, panelists, my first en encounter or my first knowledge of tension was when I came, I used to, I, I should say, I used to come every summer to visit my mother's sister in Brooklyn. And um, as a kid, I didn't know anything, but when I came back to go to college in uh, at San Francisco State where I majored in uh, African studies, when I first <coughs> got there, that's when I was told, I said, okay, uh, you don't want to live in Oakland because there are too many black folks there. 
So I was like, okay. <laughs> 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 so I was like, um, but that's where I want to be because that's what I un identify with. You know, I want to be among people. I identify that's my Guinea upbringing. You want to be among your kind, not <laughs> anywhere else. Um, so it's, that was my first encounter with that, well, with that issue. Other than that, um, having a mother from the, from the U.S. and relatives and cousins from the U.S., it's only, I really can't say that I've noticed the tension. It's only in college that I started noticing differences when, you know, you come first arrive, you're trying to be friend, uh, friends with folks, and you realize, okay, uh, I can't find, I can't be friends with folks because of A, B, or C, or these black folks are not acting right, you know, <laughs> because we have a different culture, a different mindset. And that would, that I could say is my first, uh, my first en encounter uh, with it. Okay. Well, I want to address the, um, the, 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 the point that you made about your grandmother called you African bush babies, um, because there's a power, the power of images, images. And uh, I do know that when I was growing up, the only images that I saw of African Americans was on the TV, on the box. And I'm pretty sure for those who grew up here in the United States too, the only images that they saw of Africans were on TV. It's a little different these days for kids that are under 25 and, and, and you know, because they have a lot more, an outlet, they have social media where they can choose and see other images of each, you know, of each continent, so each places. So what were the images that you saw that inform your thinking of an African man or an African American, vice versa, and how, how did that impact your? How did that impact the first time you met an African person? I mean, f if if any of those, if if you went through that, how did that impact? What was the images that you saw? I don't remember seeing many images of Africans. I mean, we had Tarzan, was still playing <laughs> in <laughs> in the mid and late sixties. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I think about it, I mean, those were the images, the Tarzan reruns that would play in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s. Um, my dad, we, we had a lot of books in our home and National Geographic and things like that. So those were images I had as well. The images of the starving African? But, though, but the, I remember commercials, mm -hmm. particularly in the 70s. Uh, when they were trying to get you to sponsor a child in Africa. I mean, I, one thing, it's interesting you asked that question, because one thing I remember that, in New York at least, um, and I grew up in Queens and on Long Island, <coughs> and I remember in school um, an insult, we, there are two insults I remember that we would often use. Uh, we would call someone an African bush baby, and we would call other classmates, black classmates, um, something related to tar baby. And those are, um, when I think about it now, it's, it's horrendous that, you know, little black kids are calling each other um, these kinds of names. And um, we obviously got it from somewhere. And I would imagine um, not only did we get it from fellow classmates, but the kinds of images that we were seeing on, on television. Uh, the Biafra baby, I remember um, calling some children calling other, or young kids calling each other Biafra babies. Um, we didn't, I don't know, didn't even know what Biafra was. Um, so I remember those things, and uh, we clearly got those messages somehow. We clearly got those messages somehow. Anybody else? Um. You know, it's the things that you say are very interesting because as I mentioned earlier, the discomfort that I would notice or sense in um, the sixth grade or junior high, it was mostly around differences based on hair texture. So my hair texture was, was different from some of the other black kids in my class or my skin tone was darker than some of the other black kids. And then it, because when I was in the sixth grade, I had an accent, my dark skin, my dark, 
dark skin became compounded with mm -hmm. the accent such that if there were people and if there were other black people around me who were just as dark or darker than me, they seemingly did not um, experience the same sensitivities that I did or weren't made fun of mm -hmm. in the ways that I would have been made fun of because they didn't have the accent even if they were as dark as I am. Mm -hmm. um, and for me growing up, as I said, I grew up both in Nigeria and here. Um, in my formative years in Nigeria, similar to you, my dad was an educator, so we, and my mom was an educator, so we had encyclopedias in the house. So I had an opportunity to flip through books that they, even books that they bought for my older siblings. So I saw pictures of black leaders. Mm -hmm. I saw pictures of blacks in the encyclopedia that were representative of black progress and leadership and black issues at the time that were published in encyclopedias that families typically had in their homes. Um, it was shocking to me when I came back to the US in the late 80s, heading into the 90s, and then that's when I started seeing images on television of what the West thought Africans looked like. And I was like, hmm, I don't really remember sitting around with flies swarming around my mouth a whole lot <laughs> all day long. And I say that because for my growing up, I, my parents chose not to raise us in the city. Um, they moved us to the village. We lived in the country with my grandparents, with the extended family. So I grew up in a very, very traditional, very typical village experience in um, a Nigerian um, town as opposed to counterparts who their parents decided to stay in the city because they worked um, certain jobs in the city and they did not want to raise their children in the village. My dad commuted to his job in the city but said, nope, you kids will stay in the village, go to schools in the village. I had to, it's funny that now I cut my hair by choice, but <laughs> when I was when I was five years old, I had to cut my hair because the missionaries had told the black people there that if your kids have hair, they will have lice and that's just a problem. So we had to cut our hair. I wore my hair this short as, a school ch as, a, as an elementary school child. Um, and at that time, I didn't really think about mm -hmm. it being a negative because all of us had our hair short. It wasn't until I came back here and saw the images that television in the West, such as those Feed the Children commercials mm -hmm. and things like that, the portrayals and the concept that they had of, that one concept that they had of what Africa was and what Africans were. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the Biafra baby, it's funny because, you know, for me, I saw those images and pictures. Um, I mean, certainly I saw, since being Nigerian, um, I come from the part of Nigeria that is Biafra. The Igbos were the ones who wanted, who were, they were the group that wanted to succeed See, yeah. from um, Nigeria and had their own country because they felt that they were being oppressed and they were not having the opportunities that they wanted um, in order to express their uniqueness as Nigerians. So the Biafrans, which are primarily the Igbo ethnic group, um, my dad, my parents actually left Nigeria during the Biafran War. So because of the Civil War in Nigeria, they left at that time to be safer um, and have their families be safe. So my father initially participated in some of my, I have uncles who fought in the war. My father participated in some of the civil rights movements that they had in Nigeria based on Biafra. He liked taking pictures. So growing up, I saw pictures of the famine. The ex so the Biafra, baby, the, the Biafra baby joke is basically that during the Biafran war, because resources were being um, stifled from certain groups and certainly the Biafrans or the Igbos, there was, there was famine. There was a lot of starvation going on. And so you had children especially who that manifestation of malnourishment mm -hmm. was a, an extended stomach. It was an extended belly and it was called kwashioko. Mm -hmm. So the disease was called kwashioko where you developed this extended stomach based on malnutrition. Um, and so my father had pictures that he took of those children because when he came to the US um, for his, um, one, escaping as a refugee, but also he ended up coming here and doing his, his graduate degree, 
he used to go around and do presentations um, and say, this is what you need to know about what is going on in Nigeria, this civil war that no one is talking about. Um, and so it's so interesting. For me, I saw those images as this is an atrocity. This is something that is happening that so many people don't know about. Whereas others saw it as an example of, oh, those Africans who are so poor and don't have anything and they don't realize that the people who saw those images and used it as a joke don't realize that those are images of war and famine and starvation um, and marginalization. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving us um, a bit of history there with the Biafran War. Um, thank you. Um, Jean-Patrick, um, I want to go back to uh, something that um, Anthony said about mm -hmm. what is, that he's noticed that Africans were treated a little different by, differently by whites in this country. Is this something that you've experienced or what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, I did notice that, that I was it was easier for me to integrate in the, to the U.S. Uh, society uh, uh, because of my background, uh, growing up in Africa, having uh, having an accent and stuff. It's uh, a little epilogue. Growing up in Guinea, you were you you were taught not to trust white folks. Period. So there were none except they worked at embassies. <laughs> or a Guinea person married uh, someone from uh, the Eastern Europe and brought her back, and that was all that you saw. There was, there was nothing else. Uh, so coming here and applying for, 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 for work or school or trying to live somewhere, yes, I didn't have any difficulties, but I would notice that my um, African-American friends did not afford the same opportunities. And it took me a while, it took a while for me to start asking questions and saying, okay, asking myself and asking them why, why, and also asking um, white people, you know, why is it a difference? But I come to find out the reason is because Africans, we don't share the same history as African Americans, so whites do not see us as threats to them. <laughs> and <laughs> Not yet, you're right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's the main. That's the main reason. So it's just like uh, I would say. Take an example uh, in Georgia, Stone Mountain. African came to settle Stone Mountain. African Americans will never go to Stone Mountain. <laughs> so, yeah, Africans they say we don't care about. It. We don't know anything about this stuff. We like it. We stay. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. After a while, you know, the color changed. In um, in uh, I think I think they started having black elected officials and stuff in the, in, uh, in Stone Mountain. So, yes, to answer your question, I think that's the thing is because of is that uh, uh, it's the history. It's history, the it's slave history. trade, the slavery um, history that white folks. Apparently, they still have some, uh, they should have some uh, guilt or apprehension. And actually, not only that, the, the institutional uh, racism that they still have in place, and they know that it's who they are targeting. And for them to better create a divide, like they have done in Africa and everywhere else, is to make sure that they favor one group as opposed to the other. So that's my... Yeah, it's interesting because I want to tie that back to the movie where the CIA agent is accepted by the Africans uh, to help as an ally, you know. And I remember from the first uh, conversation that we had last year, some people had a problem with that. Why would the Africans allow a European, what they call the colonizer, still to help them into that into their plight? So, thank you for that. Um, the main focus of, of, of this conversation is, is mainly the two main characters, which are. Prince T'Challa and Killmonger. Um, in the movie, Killmonger makes a statement towards the end of the movie when uh, Prince T'Challa <coughs> offers him, says, I will help you stay alive. And he chooses to not live. He prefers to die just like his ancestors who jumped off the slave ship. Okay. What do you think of that? 
Anthony, is it, do you think that that's still, but do you think that that's still part of the, <laughs> do, you, do, you still, do you think that that's still part of the cause, the, the root cause of whatever may be perceived as a tension that African America still holds um, some kind of feelings of, against Africans for that? I'm not sure I understand. Do you think that history, the, uh, the, the slave trade still, oh, slave trade. Slave trade still you know, makes African Americans hold some grudges against Africans? Do you think I, that's um, part of it somewhat, somehow, somewhere? That may be a part of it. I think a lot of, I know I did, I speak for myself, but I believe other blacks growing up in this country don't realize um, that Africans were integral in part of the African slave trade. Um, European men could not have done what they did were it not for the assistance and management and leadership of, of African kings and, and others. So that was a shock to me when I learned that, and I learned that not very long ago, um, probably in my late 30s, early 40s. Um, it was a shock because we don't, I did not grow up knowing that Africans participated in the slave trade. The storyline was the Europeans came and <coughs> with all these weapons and enslaved the Africans. Little did I know that assisting and actively participating and <coughs> making money from and facilitating the process were Africans. And I felt some kind of way. I really did because, uh, first of all, I just didn't grow up knowing that, so that was a shocker to learn that. And then there was a sense of betrayal. Well, how, if we are all Africans, can you sell? another African. But fortunately, you know, there's, uh, there are opportunities to learn more. And something I'm a lot more sensitive to now as I get older is not being so willing to separate black people from being human and the human condition. And human beings throughout history have done horrific things to other human beings throughout history. Black people are humans, and black people are no less vulnerable to the desires of the flesh, money, power, and the, and, and the, the material gains that money and power can bring. Black people, I don't care what we call them, African, black, black people are no less vulnerable to, to the dynamics of the human condition. So the way I feel about it now is, well, who knows? If I were an African and was approached by a European person or maybe another African um, saying, hey, we need some bodies and um, well I just had this war or I can go raid a village and get you some. Um, who knows if I'm the kind of person for whom money and power are important, then I might decide to, to do that. I don't know. Uh, so I see it in a different way now, but yeah, when I first learned that, uh, I really did feel some kind of way because I grew up, and I think I mentioned this the other day, I, I grew up in the mid-60s, late-60s, early-70s at a time when black people in this country really uh, understood the persecution they had um, been dealing with for the decades prior to the 60s. And so they were, we were um, kind of being born again in this whole black power, 
I mean, you walk down the street, you saw a black person, you acknowledge that black person. Uh, it was just a feeling growing up that I'll never forget because you just assumed, and I was very naive in this, but you just assumed that a person who looked like you, felt like you, believed like you, and you could trust that person. Nothing was farther from the truth. Um, nothing was farther from the truth. But that's how I developed, thinking that. So right. when I learned this whole you know, dynamic about Africans and slaves, that was a real, that was a moment. Okay. Lynette, can you add anything to that? Yeah, you know, thank you, because there were so many important points raised that I'm like, oh my goodness, pick this one, pick this one. Um, jumping off of what Anthony said, slavery was not new when the slaves were transported here. That wasn't a new idea or a new concept. Africa, when in other countries, whenever they won the war, whoever lost became their slave. So that was, the, that was the, a norm, and because like in Africa, it became a, a commodity to sell off their enemies. And, um, but just like when, we, when America shipped cotton to, Brit to Britain for them to develop shirts and, and do their industry, uh, again, they, they were selling, buying and selling trade, it was a commodity. I think the, the hardest thing about slavery for the African coming to the shores of America was that they dehumanized them. They took away their ability not just to be a man, but to be a human. You weren't even counted. And then these were uh, tribes of people that in, on the continent didn't even get along. But here, they, some of them didn't even speak the same languages as the others, but they didn't care about that because all they saw was free labor. And so out of, tension and trials and hardships, we do come together and unite as a people. You want to see the strongest amongst us? Let us go under some type of persecution. The communities of us gather together. The 100 black men, though, they didn't care where they were from. 100 black men marched. And of course, it was more than 100 exactly, but that was the phenomenon. When the black men and women and children were being killed by the officers, it didn't care where you came from. Black lives matter, and we all stood together. So I do say that you find the deepest and the closest bonds with whenever pre wherever persecution exists. Without that, just like every human being, we sit on a podium and look at each other and decide how I'm better than you. And we all, you know I'm educated, and you're not. Or I live on this, the west side of town, and you live on the south side. Or, and we, because there's no, we're not feeling the pressures now of every, every, I think they have with all of the items that we've been able to accumulate, I think it's rocked us to sleep. <laughs> and so therefore we're not feeling really the pressures that were felt in the 60s. When, when they stood and gave their lives like the young man from Wakanda that said I'd rather die in the sea because if I'm not gonna live free, I don't wanna live. So it wasn't even about um, taking on or becoming African or not, or, or whatever it appeared when his cousin said, I can give you the ability to live. Mm -hmm. But to him, if I'm not gonna live in the freedom of myself, that is no living at all. So I'd rather just die with the ancestors. And I just think that so when we come under things that matter to us, we are not divided. But when we don't have those pressures of life and all we can think about is the, we've got the black card, and do you know what I drive? Do you know where I live? You know, do you know what I do for a living? So then we, are divi then we divide ourselves. So a lot of times division is not from the outside, but it is from within. Thank you. Thank you. Lynette. Um, I think this is going to be the last question and then we're going to turn it over to the uh, audience and uh, see what they have to, um, to add to it. Um, 
do you have any perceived differences that you see within, whether you see it in Africans or African Americans that makes you envious or resentful? I thought about that question a lot um, when we discussed it previously, and my answer to that is no. Um, as I said, for me, I saw myself growing up, I was, I was pretty much a black girl growing up in a Nigerian household. I didn't really begin to fuse everything together until I got into my adult years where I realized that it was either an issue for outsiders, if they couldn't tell whether I was Nigerian or African American or if it was an issue inside um, where if I wasn't participating in enough Nigerian activities and I don't, and if, and if I didn't have enough Nigerian friends or anything like that. Um, but so for me, that's why I identify as multicultural. So it's like, yes, I'm my growing up, my experience, and even throughout my adulthood, whether it's chosen, um, whether it's chosen family or my immediate family, I, I, I'm aware of where we all come together, um, because even though, even though within my immediate family, whether it's those who are Nigerian, or then I also have in-laws who are not Nigerian, um, at the end of the day, we end up having to associate on our commonalities as black people. Something that Lynette brought up, um, which is important, that ends up affecting all of us. And I used to talk about this even with religion, because religion even within the culture is another interesting topic. <laughs> but because I remember as a child, I used to say to my dad, I was like, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. And growing up Seventh-day Adventist, it was just the dogma of this is what we should believe, this is what we should do, and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> and I used to ask my dad, well, are my friends not going to heaven because they're Catholic or because they're you know, um, Presbyterian or any other group and not Seventh-day Adventist? So similarly, when I look at myself as a black person or even those that I interact with who are black, something that I said Lynette brought up earlier was, when we look at current events and the things that do unify us, one conversation in, in my household is when it comes to if you walk outside and you're black and there is that perceived threat to your blackness, no one's gonna stop me first and ask me if I'm African versus African American. <laughs> They're gonna see a black woman or a black boy or a black man. That's what society reacts to is going to be the perceived external. They're not going to try and dig down to what language I speak and where I come from and whatnot or what I eat before they decide what type of response or, or reaction to have towards me. So I don't, I, I didn't have, I didn't have envy because my friends were accepting of me as I was. I also was fortunate enough to have the bravado that my parents instilled in me to say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with being who I am. And so I would explain to people gladly, I am Nigerian, I was born here, I grew up there, I'm back here now, I speak the language, there are many languages, I don't speak the other ones, I only speak Igbo, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I would gladly explain to people my background, I would gladly invite them to understand the differences even amongst Nigerians. I would say, nope, I don't know about other Africans because there are so <laughs> many countries. I don't know what they do, I don't speak their languages, I don't speak Swahili, you know, so I would, I would gladly make those differentiations for people and they would start to understand that, okay, just like, I'm from Connecticut, before I came to Georgia, I'm from Connecticut. And in Connecticut, you know, the blacks from Boston did not associate the same. They didn't want to relate to the blacks from Hartford versus the blacks from New York. If you talk to a black person in Boston, they would have an opinion about the blacks from Hartford versus the blacks from even Waterbury or, or any other part of the state of Connecticut or New England. Um, so I came to realize that we kind of like you also said, Lynette, some of, the, some of the tensions we have are created amongst ourselves. I was always aware that it's that we have differences and it's okay to celebrate our differences instead of use it to divide us. Mm -hmm. You know, Nigerians amongst themselves have differences. The Nigerians born in America versus the Nigerians born in Nigeria versus the ones who came here as adults versus the ones. Who, I mean, <laughs> there can be endless conversations and you ask any other group, 
whether you talk to a Caribbean or whether you talk to even, like I said, even African Americans within America. Being from Connecticut, I heard so many myths about blacks in the South versus blacks in the North that I could have easily chosen to be, um, to, to buy into those stereotypes and not move to the South because they were not favorable things. The blacks in the North did not have favorable views of blacks in the South. And then you ask, well, have you ever visited the South? Okay, maybe you went to the, in the summer to the country where your parents were born, but how often have you spent time amongst the diversity of black people in the South? And the South is big. Which part of the South were you in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah. But basically, like I, I tried, I have tried for myself, and I realized that it's an individual choice, choice that we each have to make, and then spread that choice towards how we interact with each other. But I made a personal choice to not have my experiences be so myopic. I had to open myself to to understanding that yes there are differences in thought for Nigerians or for Africans or for African Americans and I'm all of those people, I'm all of those things and I will open myself to understanding, asking questions, even though sometimes it gets a little tiring to answer questions and educate people, but <laughs> sometimes go ahead and do that. Educate people, let them know um, what you know so that it expands their horizon. Thank you. jean do you wanna add to that? It's funny when you talk about the South. When I first came to go to school, I went to s North Carolina Central. Yeah. I felt more at home in North Carolina than I did in California. Mm -hmm. You know, because of the, there was some form of community, some unity that I felt there that I didn't feel when I wasn't among the black folks when I wasn't in uh, California. Uh, that said, uh, envy and the other stuff, I can't say no because I focus more on what unites us, and whether we know it or not, there is a cultural unity. We, I spoke to them about that before. There is a certain cultural unity or that links us all, okay? You go to New York, Brooklyn, you see people sitting on the stoop. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we don't sit, sit in the backyard. You know, we wanna sit up front and greet everybody going by, <laughs> say hello, talk, <laughs> you know, that's, that's cultural. Um, you say most African languages are monosyllabic, you know, consonant, vowel. Uh, people say, for example, oh, black people can say ask. They always say ax. I said, it's cultural. <laughs> you know, it's in their blood. I mean, their language, original language is monosyllabic. That's what they speak. You cannot put three, four consonants together and expect someone to pronounce it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's impossible. <laughs> and if you look at uh, before uh, Christianity, Islam, and all that stuff, uh, most of where uh, the people were taken from were matrilineal society, okay? The man married into the woman family, and most often the child took the mother's name through the uncle or uh, not directly. If you look at the dynamics here in America, you say, oh, you know, black women are strong. I say, yes, they're supposed to be. It's not because what they go through, that's who they are, that's their lineage, that's what they went through, that's, they, that's, the, that's their ancestry. Mm -hmm. They come from a matrilineal society, so they take charge and they do what they got to do because that's what, that's what it is. So when you look at both, and the, on the continent and in America, you look at the different ways people behave, you say the different cultures, aside from the little rituals, mm -hmm. and you look at the, the different cultures and the way people act, you will see a lot of similarities and say, okay, this is why we do this, this is how we do that. The foods you eat, the way you prepare the food, you know, it's something that was brought over and you still kept it and there's still, still things, of course, now they pour it poison you with sugar, coke, and all that, <laughs> Coca-Cola and all that other stuff. Hey, um, hey, leave coke out <laughs> <laughs> I know, leave coke out of this. 
I know. I usually I usually take away the Coca Cola from here all the time. Say, have some water. <laughs> so, so um, that's usually what I focus on in looking at what unites us, what similarities that we have in language and culture, in uh, in uh, religion, in, in everything else. So I can't say that I have felt any any or any of the well, any of those things. I Okay, I'm gonna have to choose between Anthony and Lynette. Who wants to go? And then we have to open. <laughs> okay, Lynette, this go ahead. This is one of those times, you know, with being a strong there black you woman. Go. Okay, go, go for it. There you go. <laughs> you know something? Thank you for the the opportunity to share this. Um, I think a, a lot of the reason why a lot of our cultures are very similar, no matter if you're in the city or the south or the village or the country, is because our ancestors are the same. And it's like when you tell a story in a by the time the story gets to the 10th person, the whole story has changed. So it's like for 400 years, now by the time we're in this uh, generation, where they, I'm sure the way we do things now and the way we prepare foods and all, is f so far from the way that they bought it over um, 400 years ago in slavery, but we're still doing variations. That's why we look the same when we cook because our spices and all of that, because we still kept some of the, some of the things lasted. So when you tell a story 10 times, by the time it gets to the end, it may have one word out of the original story that is true and everything else is made up along the way, added. But I want to tip on that part about how we feel to one, towards one another, because this comes up often for me and my community. As an African-American and black person here in America who welcomely invites people of my color from anywhere around the world, as you stated early on, white people have a de de dis made a decision to divide because if you can divide, you can conquer. And because there's power, there is power in numbers and unity. So they give an image to the countries outside of the United States of what black Americans are. And then when my brethren from the Caribbean or Africa or wherever in the continent comes, they see, they look at me as the image that the white person told them I am. They said, you know, black people are lazy. Sweetie, we built this country. <laughs> you know that? If you go to any national monument in the city, and you see the statues and the, and the architect erect, look at the builder's name down there. So for you to have, but they have this impression, well, you know, I might have your skin color, but I'm better than you because. And I'm saying, whoa, whoa, whoa now. I appreciate you coming over, and I like the, the recipe you bring <laughs> for that gumbo. But, but let's talk about some things, because now that you're in this country and you're celebrating the freedoms, there was blood paid for those freedoms. So now it's not you or me, it's you and me. So let's celebrate the past of who paved the way because now that you're in America and you're having this education that you're going to use to get this uh, six-figure job, let's go back to the 30s when, when black children to go to school, they weren't given that option to, go to, 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 to be educated. And then what about the 50s and the 60s when you could go, but they were so substandard, you didn't learn anything. And then they gave you the same test that they gave the white kids when they knew they didn't teach you the same things. So I'm, all I'm saying is this. Yes, our ancestors are the same. They're the, of the same people. But since I've, we've been here longer, we've paid a price that you're coming now to enjoy. So please come with respect, that's all. Just come with respect. Don't come saying, well, you know, you're those American blacks and you know how y'all, you know what they say about y'all? Y'all at all, everybody ghetto and everybody, and everybody, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> just don't believe the hype. And just, and, and again, there's bad in every, everywhere. So please come with respect initially. And if somebody proves to you that they should not be respected, then deal with them. But please don't come over here with a broad brush that all blacks are. No, no, no. So that's the, my only issue. I was just like, you know what? I welcome, I welcome you. I love you. In fact, I believe that the, we came from kings and queens in Africa. But please don't come over here to me 
as though my parents didn't walk in the civil rights movement, as though my relatives didn't shed blood on the ground for freedoms, as though I didn't pay the price. Please don't come over here with that. So that's my only thing. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. So, um, I do have to say one thing. That's oh, okay. A, okay. That's, that's, okay. That, that's, that's, that's a hard act to follow, though. But I will say this regarding resentments or um, envy. 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 Yeah. I have a family member who is adopted, and he's a family member by blood, but he's not the biological child of these two people. And when he was about 14 or 15, um, he was told that he was adopted. And that started a cycle, a downward cycle <coughs> for this individual. And by the time he was 18 and in, into his early 20s, he was hanging out, using drugs, and, and it, it really messed him up to learn that the people who raised him as his parents were not his biological parents, even though he was a family member. So I say that to say this. I can't speak for other black people in this country, <coughs> but it feels odd knowing that my ancestors were part of a process that completely um, had complete disregard for their humanity, that there was no attention paid at all to who they were as individuals. Who was your mother? Who was your father? Where did you come from? What were some of the customs that your family had growing up? None of that was important. Absolutely none of it. And so by the time you go down the generations and you come to me or to other blacks in this country and you meet someone who is from Africa, and they may have that information, it does hurt. And we can talk about kings and queens and food and we come from this and we come from that, and maybe we do. But I can't put my finger on a map and say, well, I know that my grandfather's grandfather, who was born into slavery, here in Georgia came from this place. I can't do that. I can't say, well, my grandmother's great-grandmother, born into slavery in Florida or South Carolina and taken to Florida, I can't say she came from there. And so, for those of us who feel that culture is important and we celebrate our culture, we celebrate our cultural elements, those that we think we know, um, it hurts to know that your ancestors were subject to individuals and behaviors who had no regard at all for them as human beings. And so when you meet someone who does have access to that, as this family member of mine um, has no access to a complete side of his family, say what you will, but it does hurt. 